devastatingly horrendous backstory of Leatherface, explained in detail. Toby Hooper directed the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre film in 1974. It not only was a critical and commercial success back then, but in later times, it came to be known as one of the most influential horror films ever made. The film delivered as much gore and blood as its title promised, and it did so with a grim charm. From the very first use of the sledgehammer to the unyielding wielding of the famous chainsaw, the film never dropped the pace. Trying to be a hero often proved fruitless because courage and body parts were rarely spared by our main man antagonist Leatherface. The film was so great that legendary writer Stephen King dubbed it a cataclysmic terror. The film doesn't restrain itself. It is not simply a horror or slasher film. It goes and serves as a satire on the lifestyle of people of the 60s and 70s. First of all, it's based on real-life serial killers like Ed Gein, people who reacted in the most unhinged fashion in the face of a calamity. Secondly, the film's Sawyer family might not have turned into a bunch of violent cannibals had their jobs been intact. It was the shutting down or automation of the slaughterhouses that led to their mental degeneration. Academics and researchers haven't shied away from saying that the film is themed on capitalistic cannibalism. The Chainsaw Anthology has seen eight films released in total, several featuring varying backstories with no steady continuity. The first two movies follow on, but then continuity breaks the 1990 film. The 2003 remake and its 2006 sequel give an entirely different backstory, but the 2013 film Texas Chainsaw 3D follows the event of the first film. Finally, the latest release titled Leatherface that came out in 2017 serves as a prequel to the original film. Nevertheless, even with all this confusion, the primary element remains the same. An out-of-work family is driven to butchering humans for food, cannibalistic breadwinner being our very own Leatherface. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is based on a true story. For several decades, films have brought to life our grimmest nightmares, often blurring the line between fear born out of fantasy and the horrors of reality. One monster fitting this description is the infamous Leatherface. According to the films, he and his family would prey on innocent trespassers and travelers, often indulging in cannibalism due to a lack of employment and money to feed themselves. Furthermore, they would use the remains of their victims to make furniture. The name Leatherface holds more shock value than many other cinematic serial killers combined. Now his characterization was, of course, the brainchild of writer and director Toby Hooper. But a couple of macabre serial killers acted as great inspirations. Anyone who's even remotely interested in horror or gore must know Ed Gein, the grandfather of gore, more famously known as the Plainfield Butcher. He's known to have murdered two middle-aged women and exhumed nine corpses of women from their graves. He used these corpses to create disturbing and disgusting art, such as belts made of nipples, candle lamps made out of skulls, and chairs from human skin. But why do you think he committed such grotesque acts? One logical answer could be that he was insane. But was that the cause of his mental instability? Well, as Gein was growing up, he was neglected by his drunkard father. Naturally, he came under the strict control of his dominating mother, Augusta. She became his one true love and only friend. After Gein's brother passed away, Gein had his mother's attention all to himself and he became devoted to her. However, once she passed away, he became lonely and secluded. It turned out that Ed was so shocked by Augusta's death that he started obsessing over other women who were his late mother's age. Ultimately, he resorted to making a new mother for himself. That's when he began desecrating graves. The police revealed that he was in the process of making an entire woman's suit out of human skin so that he could be one with his mother. He would skin and mutilate these female corpses to make stuff for himself like gloves and masks. Like Ed Gein, Leatherface was a mentally disturbed person who had trouble expressing himself because he was mute. To truly express his emotions, he used several different masks. Although Ed was not a cannibal like Leatherface, his evil persona was reflected in the other gruesome acts that Leatherface and his family committed. Some argue that Gein shouldn't be considered a serial killer because of his low kill count. However, it is not known if he would have stopped killing if he wasn't apprehended. This brings us to the second inspiration behind Leatherface. 
Dean Coral and his accomplices David Brooks and Elmer Wayne Henley abducted, raped, and killed 28 boys and young men between 1970 and 1973. Brooks and Henley would bring the victims to Coral's house, offering them booze, drugs, or even money in return for sex. Later, the victims would be immobilized, and let's just say bad things were done to them. Like this trio, Leatherface's family abducted several of their victims, only for them to be served at the dinner table. Gunnar Hansen was more than efficient at playing this chainsaw-wielding killing machine. His birth was catastrophic, to say the least. No one is born a criminal, and neither was Leatherface. It was his unfavorable birth and upbringing that made him the monster that he became. According to the 2006 film The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning, an obese woman named Sloan was pregnant with a child, though she wasn't aware of her condition. One day while working at a slaughterhouse, her water broke and she asked for an emergency break, but her supervisor denied it. Soon she went into labor and died while giving birth to a deformed baby. The supervisor was a terrible man. Instead of taking the baby to a hospital or informing the cops, he simply dumped it nearby. The baby was then found by a woman named Luda May Hewitt. Luda adopted the infant and named him Thomas Hewitt. Thomas would go on to become the dreadful Leatherface. One might assume that being adopted by Luda might have spelt good fortune for Thomas. However, for some, life can be worse than death. Luda loved her young son, but she also was the reason behind his cannibalistic and violent nature. In one of the scenes when Thomas's teacher tells his mother about the boy's inclination for trapping and skinning animals, she denies it. Later, when he threatens to report this unacceptable behavior, she kills the teacher in cold blood. Had Thomas been sent to a special school, things would have played out differently. However, according to the original timeline, Leatherface was named Jedediah Sawyer. My name's Aaron. Jedediah. He was portrayed as a grown-up baby who would kill out of self-defense, but he would also kill upon direction from his family, especially his mother. Leatherface was a boy who was bullied throughout his life because of his hideous face and would later be controlled and dominated by his family. Aside from this brief detail, the first film doesn't shed any light on the character's life. Number 3. His appearance made him a victim of bullying and abuse. Leatherface's murderous nature was the result of prolonged abuse, ridicule, and ostracism. His friends mistreated him, and his exclusion from society turned him into something resembling a violent dog who was continually beaten and oppressed. The little chance of him having a normal life was taken away by his dominating and evil family. In the 2003 remake, it is revealed that Leatherface developed a disfigured visage and a dissolved nose as a result of a skin disease. This grotesque appearance was coupled with a muteness and delayed mental development. To hide his real face, he began wearing a leather mask from an early age. By the time he was 12, he was diagnosed with a rare form of mental disorder that degenerated his intellectual development. Young Leatherface became easy prey for the bullies at school. They would taunt him, laugh at him, and make fun of his abnormal personality. At the age of 15, a few kids assaulted him, throwing him to the ground, snatching his lunch, and throwing it on him and running away with his mask. When he finally reached school, he became a laughingstock. Young Leatherface gathered the courage to go up to the kid who had the mask, but to his anger and disgust, he had to retrieve it from the garbage bin. To make things worse, the teacher paid no attention to his plight, even when he was beaten up by other children. Naturally, he stopped going to school when he was 17. His immediate family, and especially Charlie, gave win to Leatherface's heated personality and murderous instincts. Come on, Tommy! This is one of those assholes who used to fuck with you in the schoolyard, Tommy! After years of abuse and parental neglect, he started working at the same slaughterhouse where Sloan had given birth to him and under the same supervisor who had left him for dead. His boss insulted him and Leatherface lost his calm and composure and ended up killing him. However, the 2017 film Leatherface follows an entirely different backstory. In this film, Leatherface didn't seem to have any facial disfigurement or skin diseases. However, he was subjected to acute mental abuse and torture because he was sent to a mental hospital at a very young age. After spending 10 years in the institution, his mother broke him out of there, though he was shot in the face by a police officer as they tried to escape. This is how his face becomes disfigured. Later, he makes two masks by carving out the skin of his victims. Sufferings of Leatherface started from a very tender age. As mentioned earlier, all the continuities tend to show that Leatherface had a troubled upbringing, and only the causes seem to have differed. The 2017 film Leatherface opens on the fifth birthday of a young Leatherface. At the dinner table are his mother Verna, his older brothers, his grandfather, and a man who is bound to a chair. He was stupid enough to attempt to steal one of the pigs belonging to the Sawyer family. I didn't steal 
of fucking pigs! If one were to judge the Sawyer family or young Jed Sawyer by watching the first half of the birthday scene, it would be difficult to say that anything was wrong or macabre. They sing the happy birthday song. Everyone looks happy. The little future killer seems to love his birthday cake and candles. The real trouble starts after Jed cuts the cake. One of his older brothers cuts out a chunk of the cake for himself, but Verna asks him to feed the guest. Give the first piece to the thief. The cake is partly made out of flesh, and the older brother shoves it down the thief's throat. It's then revealed that Jed's birthday cake will be his initiation into the family as a dreadful killer. He is to slay the thief with a chainsaw. However, throughout the scene, it is evident that Jed is reluctant to perform the task. The nervousness on his face is overwhelming, and he finally backs off but is pushed by his brother, causing the chainsaw to slice the thief's leg. Later, the hammer-happy grandfather is kind enough to finish the task. This incident was bound to take a toll on the child. It was the preface to what would later become a shocking and macabre epic novel. Conversion of a victim into a monster In the original timeline, Leatherface was portrayed as a mentally challenged young man who was forced by his family to commit murders. When Leatherface was with the Hewitt family in the 2003 remake and its 2006 prequel, he was a victim of social abuse. Years and years of ostracism turned him into a horrific killing machine. Likewise, in the 2017 film, young Jedediah was subjected to psychological trauma and suffering. His family butchered a young girl named Betty, who was the daughter of the local sheriff. When Sheriff Hartman was informed about the case, he arrived at the scene to learn of his daughter's gruesome murder. He was shocked and aggrieved by what he saw and wanted to teach the Sawyer family a lesson. You take one of mine, and I'll take all yours, Verna. To do this, he sent young Jedediah Sawyer to a mental institution where he spent his teenage years. So you see, Jed was not crazy when he was sent to the Gorman House Youth Performery. His family's crimes resulted in him spending his prime years with a bunch of bumbling yet violent mad people. Moreover, the institution changed his name to Jackson from Jedediah and stopped his family from visiting him. So the young boy grew into an adult with a changed identity and no family. But it's easy to see how different his life would have been had he continued to stay with the Sawyers. They were no less crazy than the inmates of Gorman House. In the later years of his institutionalization, Verna would unyieldingly attempt to meet her son. I want to see Jed. We've been through this before. She managed to break into the facility one day, and the chaos that ensued resulted in a mass breakout. On his way out, Jed saved a nurse named Elizabeth from fellow inmates, and the two escaped the scene only to be caught by Sheriff Hartman. He shot Jed and scarred his face, proceeding to kidnap both him and Elizabeth. However, Hartman wasn't able to kill Jed because the Sawyer family arrived and thrashed Hartman to a pulp. Later, they kidnapped Hartman and Elizabeth. At the Sawyer house, we see that Jed gets his face stitched, taking on the horrendous look of Leatherface. He gets his revenge on Hartman using his chainsaw, though this time Jed was not afraid to use the instrument. He had been molded into a vicious and cracked man who was headstrong in killing the one who had separated him from his family. While all of this was happening, Elizabeth managed to escape the house only to be caught in a bear trap. In a scene that's dark and comic, we see how Leatherface tries to reason in the woeful pleas Elizabeth makes. However, Jed would not stand his mother being insulted and he sealed Elizabeth's fate with a swing of his chainsaw. Jedediah Sawyer would go on to carve out the faces of Elizabeth and Hartman to make himself two masks, and in doing so, he would become the titular monster named Leatherface. <laughs> Stories behind different masks of Leatherface Different films have given various explanations for Leatherface's several masks and the purpose that they serve. In the first film, he wears the old lady mask when he wants to be involved in domestic life and help in the kitchen. He liked the pretty woman mask at the dinner table, which also had makeup, because why not? With this mask, he also wore a wig and a black suit. Finally, he wore the killing mask when he was running around and chasing his victims, or when he was butchering them to provide the raw material for dinner. So basically, Leatherface donned different masks to express different emotions and feelings, which was naturally tough for him because of his muteness. The masks defined his personality and who he was at a particular moment, and what he would be doing throughout that day. 
However, it is important to note that Leatherface's mask is his only personality. Underneath it, he's a hollow husk without any character or major emotions. The later films gave more substantial reasons to his masks, such as his facial disfigurement as a result of diseases or gunshot wounds. In the 2017 film, we see him wearing a cow's head instead of a mask, although his face is perfectly fine. No, good. Was Leatherface really an evil guy? While Leatherface remains one of the most gruesome serial killers in the history of Hollywood, the question of whether he was truly evil or just a victim of abuse remains unsolved. Many believe that he was simply an overprotective and enthusiastic property owner. Yes, he killed the trespassers by swinging his chainsaw in the bloodiest of fashions, but had they not trespassed, they'd be happy and alive. Well, at least alive. Characters like Michael Myers from Halloween, Freddy Krueger from Nightmare on Elm Street, and others are known to go on rampages and kill just for fun or to satisfy their murderous rage and hunger. Leatherface doesn't do that. He is not a sadist who kills because he likes to. Since the beginning of time and throughout several films, he is killed and mutilated only because he was asked to do so or because he was protecting his family. His social and psychological conditioning turned a sweet young boy into a man hell-bent on killing intruders. For instance, in the 2017 film, he is forced to witness the gruesome death of two victims and later sent to a mental asylum. In the original movie, he is treated hardly better than a family pet. In the 2003 remake and its prequel, he is conditioned by Charlie and Luda into cannibalism and murder. Although he is a violent slasher in general, within the confines of his house, he's a victim of domestic torture and abuse. Marvelous Videos is of the opinion that Leatherface is like a wild animal that's been tamed by a bunch of cruel owners. When he's out in the open, he kills when necessary and shows the strength of a raging bull. But when he's with his masters, he tends to act like a shivering cat. Please let us know in the comments what you think of him. Future of the Leatherface franchise According to the latest news, 2021 will have a new Leatherface film that will depict an older Leatherface and would probably be set in the year 2021 with David Blue Garcia expected to direct it. The director of the 2016 film Don't Breathe Fede Alvarez is set to produce the new Leatherface film, so we may expect a better outcome than the 2017 prequel. According to Alvarez, the new movie is going to be a direct sequel, and it will be interesting to see that effect 50 years have laid on Leatherface. Naturally, he wouldn't be able to chase his victims for miles through the woods, and he'd certainly lack the physical strength to do much of anything else either. This movie may also mean the end of the Leatherface franchise, just as it happened for Rambo in the 2019 film. Of course, Rambo and Leatherface are incomparable, but if you look from the standpoint of a tough character that has become old and cannot keep up with the current times, his demise seems very likely. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.